What up guys, it's Jay here and welcome back to TV Time with Jay. This time we'll be reviewing The Boys Season 2, Episode 4, Nothing Like It in the World. As per usual with my episode reviews, I will be recapping the events of the episode and then going over my thoughts and feels about the different plot points all throughout. So if you haven't seen the episode yet, do yourself a favor, watch the episode first, then come back here and tell me your thoughts and feels in the comments down below because I will be going into spoiler territory. You have been warned. Okay, so... In case you missed it, I did do a review of the first three episodes of The Boys because uh, Amazon did like a Hulu-style premiere thing where they dropped the first three episodes last week and now from this point onward we're going to be doing weekly episodes. I know I'm late with this particular one. It's like three days late or technically like, yeah, three days late. I counted correctly, uh, but uh, I promise I will be more on time uh, next week. I was just kind of busy this weekend. But regardless, I will leave the review of the first three episodes, the premiere, in the end card and the card you're about to see on screen. So if you missed those, go check that out, then come back here and watch this review. Alright, so, bottom line, that premiere set a really strong tone for this season, you know. Uh, Obviously, The Boys is not a bright and happy superhero show. If you're familiar with the comics, you are all too familiar with that. I mean, this is written by Garth fucking Ennis, uh, one of the most, like, on point, but also, like, super, super cynical, especially towards, like, the, the cape genre of comics. So, uh, this was definitely kind of his big, kind of, like, not necessarily a fuck you exercise, like that's the whole like point of the comic series and uh, this show itself is not just a parody of superheroes but also kind of a uh, deconstruction of the genre as well um, and uh, the bleak tone of season two really kind of shows kind of the, the faults of the genre and kind of the faults of some of the tropes. So. With this episode, basically, the major theme hammered throughout is kind of everyone being alone on the team. Now, uh, this is handled from very uh, different angles for a, a, a very different characters all throughout. So uh, we're going to start with probably the uh, biggest one throughout the episode, and that's, of course, Billy. You know, Billy Butcher. He ends up meeting back up with his wife Becca of course they have a tear-filled emotional reunion they reconnect um, you know she talks about like leaving with him and like them taking Ryan and how much you know he's gonna like Ryan he's such a sweet boy you know she's raising him the right way he's not gonna be another homelander like they can do this they can you know be a family and you know Billy He's just kind of smiling and nodding, you know, he does, of course, want to say Becca. But with everything that supers have done, everything he's discovered about, like, super society, as well as just Homelander in particular, having a constant reminder of Homelander, like, around him, even if it's not the kid's fault, that's going to be just too much for Billy to handle. And eventually, Becca does realize that, and she confronts him on it. She's like, no, Billy, I know you better than anyone on this entire planet. You know, you didn't say it to me, but I saw it in your face last night when we were talking, and I see it in your face now. You would find a way to eventually get rid of him. You do it in a subtle way. You do it in a way where I wouldn't really notice or question it, but you would find a way to try to get rid of him. And then instead of bullshitting, you know, Billy cuts right to the chase. He goes, he is VOD property. There's no way they were going to let him go. And eventually, you know, when, of course, Becca defends her son, she mentions, right? Like, you know, he is my kid. If I leave him alone, he's going to be raised by VOD. He's going to be raised without a mother. And then we'll just have Homelander Part 2 on our hands, and there are going to be two assholes in the world with all this power. Do you really want that? I don't want that. He's a sweet kid. I love him. He is my son. I don't care how fucked up the circumstances are. That was out of his control. That's not his fault. I'm not going to blame him for it. 
And you know what, Billy? I'm going to be straight up with you. I am scared of the path you're on. The path you're on is a place that I cannot follow. You get so consumed by vengeance. You were just one bad day away from going off the rails. Which is exactly why when Homelander raped me and I found out I was pregnant, I was scared. I didn't tell you. I went to VOD, not you, because I knew if I went to you, you would react like this. You would get angry. You would seek vengeance. You would chase after him like no tomorrow until you got your revenge, no matter who it hurt or who got hurt in the process. And I can't deal with that. I can't have that on my hands. I'm not built like you, Billy. I can't be a part of this war. And this right there, like, if you know Garth Ennis, right? Garth Ennis is most notable for his work on The Punisher, particularly Marvel Knights Punisher and eventually Punisher Max, right? So Garth knows the character of Frank Castle better than most writers at Marvel, past, present, or future. So to hear Becca give this speech to Billy, this is the exact type of speech that Frank Castle needed to hear in order to get his ass in check. And of course, Billy reacts the way Billy does and is like, you know what? Fuck him. It's his fault. I am going to take him out so that I can get my wife back. He's going to go full vengeance mode. It's like, nope, I'm not blaming her. This is all on him. If he hadn't have done this, I would be with my girl. I would be happy. This is on you. And then it's just like, you know, we know that Billy is on the warpath. Now, you know, a lot of the, like, lone wolf attitude is echoed throughout a lot of the character story beats in this episode. But there is one pair of characters that is set more on a less destructive path. And that's, of course, Frenchie and Kimiko, or the female of the species. So... Of course, last episode, Stormfront straight up massacred, you know, Kimiko's brother. And she, rightfully so, wants vengeance. But Frenchie is able to stop her from throwing her life away just to, you know, get the satisfaction of trying to avenge her brother. Uh, he knows there are better ways to do this. And you can do it without just, you know, making yourself a martyr or wasting your life. And again, that's a lesson that Billy needs to learn. That's a lesson that Starlight needs to learn. It's a lesson that Huey needs to learn. Pretty much everyone in the boys. And I'm glad that, like, despite the fact that Frenchie has been high as a kite all throughout this episode, Frenchie kind of, you know, has his priorities straight. Um, and we have, speaking of the boys... Their whole subplot with Huey, M.M., and Starlight, because she ends up coming along after Homelander confronts Starlight, and uh, he almost kills her in the elevator, and she, you know, straight up channels her feelings and is like, look, I am not with Huey Campbell. Huey Campbell broke my heart more than anyone else in this world, and there are some times where I want to melt his fucking face off. So no, I am not with Huey Campbell. Am I lying now, asshole? I just did not want to be a cold-blooded murderer. So forgive me for not killing someone on your orders in cold blood. And so he drops her because he realizes she's not lying. And we just kind of see that Homelander just continues to spiral and spiral out of control. Right? And... It gets to the point where he outs Maeve as gay and also like is threatening Maeve's girlfriend Elena as well so you know she's fucking scared out of her mind which you know she rightfully should be because it's fucking Homelander and then Homelander is also dealing with Stormfront who we find out quite possibly is not as young as she seems. Uh, I actually think 
that, you know, you know, where the show is going, we are finding out the truth about Stormfront pretty early, that Stormfront is indeed just uh, Super Liberty, the female kind of equivalent to Homelander from way back in the day, just rebranded. And she uses her powers in a different way. You can tell she uses still the, you know, very strong racist language. Uh, she, you know, called Kimiko's brother a yellow bastard. And, of course, when she killed, you know, that woman's brother, she called him a black piece of shit. So, same racist rhetoric, very similar voice, uh, like, same brutality and just callousness. You know, um, M.M., Starlight, and Huey basically kind of interview um, this woman who basically tried to get word out about this rogue, aggressive superhero. But, of course, Vod gave them hush money to keep it under wraps. But now they know, and so they're going to follow this trail and eventually find out that Stormfront has rebranded. And she is Super Liberty. And, you know, it's hinted out throughout the episode that Stormfront is Super Liberty because in the conversation she has with Homelander, it's like, no, you just need to change. You need to rebrand with the times, you know, Lord knows I have. Like, just that subtle line drop is enough to make you think, okay, she has to be Super Liberty. She's the one who did these just crazy racially charged murders and just used VOD to cover it up. Um, and you can tell very much, like, even though, you know, The Boys was written, like, years and years ago, uh, it finished up, I want to say, in, like, 2014, something like that, 20, 2015, maybe even earlier than that, uh, but, like, even though it was written, like, years ago, it's still pretty relevant to the day, because, you know, of course, Starlight, not Starlight, Stormfront changed her method, you know, she went from being just, you know, all-American liberty lady to this, like, rebellious, you know, have the people rise up and fight the power, fear-monger, classic tactics to get people riled up and on her side. She even said to Homelander, you have fans, I have soldiers. So now... We really do know her motives and kind of like how she operates. Um, and we see by the end, Homelander is even more unhinged. You know, he's been having Doppelganger shapeshift into Stillwell so he could have his weird mommy fetish thing continue. And then eventually, by the end, he's like, I don't need anyone and he snapped doppelganger's neck and that's just where we end the episode so it's just like holy shit now homelander just gives no fucks anymore and that right there is probably the most dangerous thing that could happen for our intrepid heroes you know quote unquote you know the boys so we are in for one hell of a fucking ride and i am here for every second of it it's about to be really intense, uh, but let me know what you guys thought about this episode in the comments down below, as always. Don't forget to leave this video a like to let me know you enjoyed it, and if you like what I do here and you want to see more from me, be sure to hit that subscribe button and notification bell if you haven't already so you get updated every time I upload a new video. I do plenty of TV reviews all throughout the week, at least twice a week uh, right now until the fall season really kicks in. Uh, but uh, I got plenty of stuff. Uh, like I said, in the outro card, I will leave linked my review of The Boys Season 2 premiere in case you missed that. And I will leave linked a video YouTube and serious algorithm that you might like, which I hope you do. But until next time, guys, this is Jay from TV Time with Jay. And until next time, I'll catch you later. Like I always say, once a boys fan, always a boys fan. Peace.